Hi everyone, I'm Carly. This is Zudu Virtual Safari. Today we are featuring rhinoceros hornbill. So yesterday we did greater one horn rhinoceros. Today we're doing rhinoceros hornbills and that's just a coincidence. We're not going to try to link every animal to the next one each day because I don't know how I do that for tomorrow. <laughs> so just let us know when you're here. Join us in the comments. If you don't know, we've actually moved our rhinoceros hornbills. If you are a fan of bird world, these were the guys you'd see just before you got to the aquatics room where sloth lived. Um, and now they live here in Congo basin, just after the mandrel exhibit. Hi, Alicia. Nice to see you. So you can come see them. I will flip it around in a second and you might have a better sense of place of where we are. Hi, Xander. Great to see you. Uh, so they're just, east of the mandrels. So we're going to get started here. Keeper Jessica is going to talk to us about these birds. She's going to do some training and we're going to learn a lot about them today. So I'm excited and I hope you are too. Hi Jessica. Hi everyone. So I'm going to get a little closer so we can hear you and everything. Uh, yeah, tell us who we're here with. Well, welcome to our Congo Basin exhibit. Um, we have a different species of hornbill in here, but we currently have our rhinoceros hornbills. Um, these guys are some of my favorites because they are just um, really intelligent and interesting birds to work with. Um, they're also huge, so it's kind of um, can be a little intimidating to work with them, but they're um, really friendly birds and they will often come close to us for training sessions. So we're going to try to get them to come down a little bit lower. Um, sometimes it's a little awkward for them to move around. You'll see as they start trying to move around um, that this they have to kind of make their way through these different branches um, in certain ways just because they are so large. And so um, we'll try to get them down, come a little bit closer down here for their training session. Bella, come. Hi, Ashley. Thank you. A friend made this mask for me. So thank you to Hope. I'm good, Alicia. It's a little hot today. Uh, but when the sun kind of goes behind the clouds and we get a breeze, it feels great here. Hi, Damien. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Nancy. Uh, so who... What are their names? So yeah, we've got our two rhinoceros hornbills here. Stella is the female. She's the one on the lower branch. I'm not sure if you can see her eye color, but she has kind of a bluish white eye. Um, and then our male is named Saint, and he has a redder eye. And that's typical of this species. The best way to tell them apart is by their eye color, which is, I think, really interesting. It's not something you often see. Usually we'll see feather colors be different in males and females and birds. Um, but eye color is how you tell with these guys eye color so even if you're kind of far back you don't get the luxury of being in the habitat like jessica and i are right now you'll probably notice that you can't really see saint's eyes from far away they don't stick out the way stella's do because hers are so bright yeah let's see if true. i can zoom in so you can definitely notice the blues of her eyes you might not notice saint's red eyes which is so cool by the way uh but you'll notice they're harder to see so that's a great way to tell them apart. Michael wants to know what are we feeding them? So these are grapes. Grapes are one of the hornbill's favorite food items and the reason why we do these training sessions with them is to um, help us get a really close look at them every day. We can take a look at their feet and their eyes and their beaks and their casts and their feathers. You can even see that both of them have tail feathers growing in right now with them this close. Um, they're going through their annual molt which is when they will lose um, Really all birds do this. They'll lose um, feathers and then grow new feathers back in and that keeps their feather condition really healthy and good. Um, so, so yeah. Hi Sheila, she just yeah. joined. These are rhinoceros hornbills and you're right, they are a large bird. They are. So they're pretty, how much do they weigh? Cause it's always surprising to me how light birds yes. are given their size. They are, especially with this big cask on their head, you would expect for them to be very heavy. Um, so these guys, the females will weigh between um, four and a half to five pounds, and the males will weigh somewhere above five pounds, usually between five and six and a half pounds, something like that. Um, so they are um, perhaps lighter than they might look, and their cask, which is that piece on their head that they're named for, the rhinoceros-looking cask, um, so that piece above their beak is actually um, a really fascinating structure because it doesn't, it's not solid. It's made of the same um, material as your fingernails are, so it's kind of that softish but hard material um, called keratin. And these guys um, have kind of a spider webbing going on inside of the cask that um, gives it a lot of structural integrity but doesn't um, weigh them down too much. Because as you can imagine, 
flying through a forest with this huge thing on your head uh, would be pretty challenging if that were really heavy. Very true. Do we know what purpose the cask serves? So there's um, a number of theories, but um, I think the, the one that most people land on is try, it allows them to kind of cause their voice to um, go across the forest better so they can call to each other. They do have a very large call, or a very loud call, I should say. Um, so the other thing, though, is people think that the casks that all hornbills have could be for um, sexual selection, allowing birds to choose a good mate based on the look of their cask or things like that. Um, M Marie wants to know, are they intelligent birds? Um, yeah, that is a really good question. So I would say they're of kind of an average intelligence. They, they aren't as um, classically intelligent like you would think of as maybe a parrot species or something like that, but they are pretty bright. Um, they can figure things out pretty quickly. We do try to give them a variety of different enrichment items to keep them busy. Um, <laughs> they're gonna do a feeding behavior. So one of their behaviors that they do with each other that's um, really important for their pair bonding is to feed each other. And so you may, we may see some of that during this training session where um, one of them will feed the other one. And that's really important for their pair bonding. It allows the uh, male to kind of prove to the female what a good dad he's going to be when she's sitting in the nest because their nesting behavior is actually very, very interesting. Yeah, so let's talk about, well, first let's say, are they a breeding pair? So yes, these guys are recommended for breeding. Um, we have never unfortunately had chicks from them before, although they have shown some pretty positive nesting behaviors in the past. So um, we're hopeful that in this new space where they have some out outdoor space and indoor space that we might get some good um, breeding behaviors from them. Um, so yes, they are. we are hopeful that these guys will breed, but this species is actually very, very challenging to breed in um, a zoo setting, they've proven to be. Um, now let's talk about where they're from in the wild. A lot of people want to know where you can find sure. these birds and that nesting behavior you said. Yeah, so um, they are from Southeast Asia, um, mostly the tropical rainforest type habitats. They rely on large trees to breed. Um, and the reason, well, and to hop around really, as you can see, they're very arboreal. They would never really spend very much time on the ground. Um, they'll eat fruits out of those large trees as well. So um, a big part of their nesting behavior is for them to find a nesting cavity inside of a um, tall, large tree that the female can fit into, but has a pretty small entrance. And then um, they will actually mud the female up into that, um, that nesting cavity. And so she will be stuck in there for um, the, the entire part of her incubation period where she's sitting on the eggs, as well as the first about half of the chick's life. So she'll be in there for several months at a time. And the only way that she can get food while she's in there is for the male to come and feed her through the cavity entrance. That is so interesting. So I, I can imagine that's why it's hard to replicate in zoo setting. Yeah, so it's um, tricky to give them a, a cavity of the right size and shape that they feel really comfortable. And then also to kind of um, replicate that mudding behavior that they would do. And the other thing that um, is tricky as well is trying to get them to have a mate that they really like because the female has to really, really like and trust her mate in order to nest with him. So you said you you think these two do trust each other and have a good relationship? I think so, yeah. The um, They show a lot of the of good behaviors like the male feeding the female. He's like trying to get down right now. <laughs> they get a little awkward when they're up high in that tree. Um, so, so yeah, the, they do show a lot of good behaviors. Um, of the male feeding the female and things like that. And we have had her um, mud into a nest before, um, but when she emerged from the nest, there weren't any chicks. So we thought the eggs might have been infertile, perhaps. Interesting. How long have these two been a pair? So that's a great question. So Saint is 21 years old and Stella is um, at least 22 years old. We're actually not sure her exact um, hatch day. And Saint actually just turned 21 last week on Friday. So um, these guys are definitely in their adult years. Um, and they've been together um, for at least 10 years, maybe more like um, 12, but I'd have to look that up to see. What exactly. is the lifespan of a rhinoceros hornbill? So these guys can live to be um, into their 30s, 35. Into their? Um, kind of 
as long as they will live in these settings. I'm keeping an eye. Saint is like all the way at the top of the habitat on the like highest branch above yeah. us. <laughs> and I'm just like so worried he's gonna dive bomb down. Yeah, he's uh, <laughs> these guys actually, they do make me nervous sometimes when they get really close to me because that beak is so strong. If they tried to attack you, that they, they could really hurt. But these guys are very gentle. Um, I've never had them come really close to me or try to do anything mean to me. <laughs> Our, probably our biggest danger is getting pooped on. Uh, yeah, and that has <laughs> happened to me here. And I know for every keeper, it has hap yes. happened to them as well. <laughs> uh, what is their conservation status? A lot of people are wondering, are they endangered? Yeah, that's a great question. So these guys are considered near threatened. So they are um, on that IUCN list of species of concern. Um, they are also declining. So they could potentially become um, you know, vulnerable or one of the more serious um, concern levels in the future um, and a lot of that is because of the habitat loss in their in their range there's a lot of deforestation much of that is due to um, palm oil um, farming which um, if it's not done sustainably can can take down a lot of that really important old growth forest for these hornbill species and others that are other species that are um, very similar to them as well yeah um there was a really good question here. I want to pull it up. Oh, if they don't, you know, there are a lot of grapes on the ground. They maybe didn't catch them. They maybe bounced off a branch. Um, are they the type that can go pick them up off the ground? I have seen them go and pick grapes up off the ground. They're highly motivated by grapes though. So if they mm -hmm. drop some other piece of food onto the ground, it's pretty unlikely that they would go down and get it. Are they prey birds or not? So yeah, that's a good question. They, they could be hunted um by other animals in their forest but they they're so arboreal and they're so large that i think they don't have a ton of predators um they do also they are omnivorous they will definitely eat um they mostly eat fruit that's kind of their favorite but they we also feed them um pieces of meat and um also a pelleted bird food that's really healthy for them so um but i've also seen them um like take down a small bird or something like that they are omnivorous where they will sometimes catch little wild birds that try to eat their food or something like that so they they do hunting behaviors as well yeah they'll eat um lizards and things um we don't feed them lizards but we feed them other meat items and um those are the kinds of things that they eat in the wild though is some types of meat but mostly fruit Someone asked about the sounds and vocalizations they make. We're kind of hearing some of it. It's kind of like a little squawk. Yeah, so <laughs> they'll make kind of that that really quiet little sound, but they also make a very, very loud booming call. Some people actually think it sounds like a primate um, as they're walking through Primate Panorama, which is where these guys are now. Um, they have a really loud call that will kind of echo across the entire Primate Panorama. Um, but it turns out to be some birds. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Ashley says, I love them so much. He loves to talk and dance for me. So she must be talking about Saint. Can't wait to come see him again. Uh, Nancy wants to know what their average wingspan is. So these guys, Stella, what are you doing? Where's Stella going? Um, she's like, am I going to go inside? Are you out of grapes? Uh. When, what was the question? Wingspan? Yeah. Um, well, their their body length is three feet-ish. And wingspan is a great question that I don't know the answer to, but if I had to guess... Oh, there I she saw, goes. <laughs> Stella! If I had to guess, it'd probably be... Um, I don't know. I would guess like in the six foot range, but I could be... Oh, don't wow. quote me on that, guys. You have to Google that one. <laughs> uh, a reminder for Joy, she may have missed this answer. How long do they live? Into their 30s, you said? Yes. Um, they <laughs> live into their 30s pretty regularly. Saint, of course, is high in the tree. It's very hard to see Saint from here, so I'm going to try yeah. to get a better view yeah. of Saint. Uh, Alicia says, how much do they weigh on average? We answered that as well. Uh, Stella is about four pounds. Yeah, four and a half, five, and Saint would be more like five six and a half you can tell them apart by that oh. as well thanks for moving Saint. that actually helped help us see you come on down Saint. So this is a cowbell we'll often use as a cue for them that we're about to do a training session so um, this noise means to them that they need to either shift outside or inside for us um, or also come down for a training session so 
We can try that to get him to come down. And if he decides to stay up high in the tree, then that's his choice. <laughs> no worries, guys Joy. sometimes make their own decisions. Mm -hmm. Stella! No need to apologize, okay, Joy. We're happy to answer these questions. People pop in and out, so we're, we're happy to to answer whatever people want to ask. We might do our kind of last call, especially if Saint doesn't come down here. We don't want to just stare at the trees for 15 more minutes, but he might be trying to figure out a way to get back down here because those are small branches, very leafy up there. So Nancy says, do these birds mostly hop and climb up and down in a tree? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, they will kind of do the long distance flights um, from a large tree to another large tree occasionally but you'll mostly see them do this hopping behavior where they'll hop and make short distance flights um, they have a very very strong feet and legs that um, allow them to make these short hops around in the canopy of the trees and they do spend most of their time super super high up in the canopy so um, that's part of what we're seeing from saint here i think as well <laughs> um i know i feel like i'm always a, a wild card when i come into these habitats yeah. <laughs> It's always a new thing and I always like scare off the animal, just like Bandu yesterday. Um, <laughs> what is your favorite part about working with horn, rhinoceros hornbills? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, these guys kind of surprise me. I work with a lot of parrot species and so they tend to be some of my favorites just because of their personalities. But these guys, um, I have a special place in my heart for them now. Um, we've done a lot of really cool things with them, um, moving them over here from bird world um, into their new habitat. So we had to get a lot of things set up for them which is a really cool challenge. Um, and then also, uh, they're just really motivated to train for us with our grapes. So we're gonna get to hear them. <laughs> Good job, Saint. <laughs> I think he does sometimes call back and forth with the lemurs. I don't know if you can hear that on the Facebook Live, but the, the lemurs and some of the other primates will get going and then he'll kind of do his calls as well. Yeah, it might be hard to pick up, but to our ears standing here, we can definitely hear the lemurs. So he's going back and forth with them. And Nancy, you're right, he is just a show off. He went all the way to the top there so then he could do his fantastic call. Yeah, and sometimes the um, the female will be inside and the male will be outside and we'll hear them call back and forth to each other, which is also part of their kind of courtship and bonding. Joy so, says they sound like dinosaurs to her. They do sound a lot like dinosaurs. In fact, if you have to um, have them in hand for a veterinary exam. They really sound like dinosaurs. They have this, like really guttural growl sound that's like pretty intimidating. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, we've done a lot of really good things with this species. We've been involved in uh, hormone analysis with them. So part of our training session is to get them to come close, but also to um, possibly be able to give them medications if they needed it as well as to um, do these um, hormone tests that we do with them. So we'll give them a grape that has dye, food dye in it, um, just like food coloring, like what you put in a food safe. frosting or something. Yep, exactly. And then um, that will pass through their system and cause their feces to be different colors. And so then we'll collect the feces and submit it to a lab and they will do hormone testing to see if our birds are cycling um, together in their breeding cycle and trying to basically figure out if there's any way we can um, help them with their breeding cycle and do research on breeding this species in zoos because it is an important species in zoos as an ambassador to their wild counterparts. Buddy, are you coming down? thinking about it now. I know Saint's, Saint's starting to kind of work his way down. He's made his call. So we're going to give it a couple more minutes, see if Saint joins us here at eye level. I think he's trying to. <laughs> there he goes. So at least we can see him better here. It looks like he's going to go to this branch. It's kind of like that show Floor is Lava. And he's got to yeah. find a branch he can go to. Who's watching Floor is Lava on Netflix? Let me know. <laughs> It's a, it's one of those really great low budget kind of game shows that oh, Netflix has been it. producing, which is just perfect for this time of yes. staying home a lot. It is perfect. Uh, hi, Michael. So you in, uh, do you mean where do they live here at Denver Zoo or where do they live in the wild? Um, and Alicia wants to know, do we do blood draws on them? And if so, where do we take the blood from? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we don't have them currently trained for any voluntary blood draws, but if we did need to do a blood draw for any medical reason, then um, typically they would, the veterinarians and the techs will often take blood from a jugular vein is really common, 
Um, also, birds have a vein on their wing that can be a good place to draw blood, so I've seen it done there for some species as well. So he's gone further out and he doesn't yeah. like those branches. So he's just kind of doing his own thing right now, I think. He, I, how many times does he go up there a day? He should know how to get back down. <laughs> Don't you think so? Um, so Michael, if you're wondering where they live at the zoo, they live in Primate Panorama in the Congo Basin area. So with our new one-way path, you would go through Great Apes, you'd walk around the forest aviary, you'd come see the mandrels, and then you'd come see uh, Saint and Stella. Um, where do they live in the wild again, Jessica? So these guys are from Southeast Asia. I think we might be blocking his perch that he wants to use. That might be part of his issue. Here you go. Good job. Um, so these guys live in Southeast Asia, Borneo, Java, um, the rainforest in those areas where they're most commonly found. Are they related to toucans? They look they look a lot like so, yeah, my Fruit a, Loop that's toucan That's a great Sam. question. Yeah, um, some they are not actually in the same family as toucans. They are in a closer family to um, other species like um, kingfishers and things like that. Very cool. All right, so there goes Stain, which is <laughs> fine. That, that is part of what we do here at Denver Zoo. We give our animals choice. We saw him for a second and then he went behind the scenes. I don't blame him, it's hot. So yeah. thank you everyone for the great questions. Let us know what you learned about rhinoceros hornbills in the comments. Um, we're so happy to bring some more bird species to you all. Yeah. The birds need more love here and more appreciation. Um, so it's great to learn so much about how they're really so different from species to species. So thank you so much to Jessica for answering your questions and doing this training session and allowing me to learn a little bit more about the rhinoceros hornbill. So thank you all and we'll see you next time. Bye.